Aloha Awina La. This is Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, Fridays at 3 p.m. Keeping it on the bright side and off the grid. Last June, Carl Kim and I discussed possibilities for a mid-course correction on Honolulu's rail project, including bringing it to street level. You can find that show along with all the others at thinktechhawaii.com. My guest today is Scott Wilson, contributing author and spokesman for the Honolulu Transit Task Force. He is also the former chair of the AIA Regional and Urban Design Committee. Mr. Wilson is part of a group of Honolulu architects and planners who have come up with a brilliant wave to save three to four billion dollars and our destination travel worthy view planes. Scott, thank you so much for coming down Aloha, to talk Kali. to us. Very happy to be here. Oh, I'm so excited that Good. this is really getting some traction. Yes. But it's a it's it's a complicated thing. It is, and, and it's a big it's a big change. You know, we even though it doesn't take that much time, really, and and that we'll actually finish the job five years sooner. Uh, when we talked to legislators this morning, they were just all thinking, well, what about this and what about that? Because you you you're asking for a change, you're making modifications in a very big project. And this big project behind us. Mmm. Yeah. Yuck. That. It's so ugly. Please, yes. <laughs> save us. Well, I, I don't want to go into the ugliness because, I, okay. you know, aesthetics are, are a relative okay. thing. But what we've really made the pitch uh, for is to save billions of dollars, three billion or more, and to save time, to save five years. Shaping five years off of construction is a huge uh, thing. We've got Very commuters serious. that are just suffering, and every year that they have to just continue to put up with this is, is just a real shame. And um, so we have some pictures of, of what, what we're facing, um, what is planned. Right, we're looking at the uh, the Chinatown station, uh, and that's that's what's planned right now at Kekalike Street, and you can see that's right next to the harbor, uh, and and, w and um, there's just there's no way to to hide that thing. It, it's going to completely kind of. Um, yeah. It's just a big hulk towering over, over Chinatown. All those little small little buildings are just going to be dwarfed by the scale of this thing. And this thing is cutting off their entire view to the harbor. Not only the view, we also know how these things tend to collect garbage and other unpleasantries mm -hmm. and magnify the sound. I haven't really seen that in the literature, but um, yeah. I know that when I travel to places that have those systems, that that is is a significant decrease in quality of life yeah. just having the the noise and the lights and all the trash yeah so think of think of the viaduct at the airport i mean that is not a place where you want to go walking it's not a place where you want to enjoy the the sun and the wind and and uh, just our you know our beautiful landscape it's it's just all dwarfed by this massive amount of concrete. But, but, but there's a lot of really good reasons, um, practical reasons, uh, for this to change. And it seems mm -hmm. doable. Let's have a, a picture of what we're actually talking about so it could... Yeah, this is, a, this is a perfect example of an elevated rail that is coming down to street level. And this is actually in Charlotte, North Carolina. I just liked it because it shows it's not a big, great big distance. It's about five to six hundred feet, and and we have that kind of we have that kind of space certainly at Middle Street and, and several other places. So it's not that the, oh the ramp coming down is going to take a mile and is going to cut off five different streets. It's not that at all. It can come down very quickly, and um, and then you're on the street level and you're saving billions of dollars. And you can see by, uh, from this um, that it's uh, very inclusive, there's easy access, it will be very visitor friendly because the access will be... I know, I, I just think um, we, if we want to talk about our, our handicapped uh, or, or even mobility limited uh, riders, what can be easier than just you know stepping in off of the sidewalk instead of going upstairs, going up escalators, elevators, elevators all of that. Uh, all of those things are mechanical and are going to break down in our climate. Uh, we all know that. Uh, so we just think this is this is avoiding a lot of those problems. Okay, but we can't just um, uh, translate it 
there's some modifications that are going to have to be made. Can exactly. you can you talk about those? Yeah, I think the the one that I think has got most people uh, confused is is the power supply. We we all know that the elevated rail is running on a third uh, power rail that's right next to the other two rails, and that rail is live and can't be touched uh, for for electrocution reasons. So. What happens? What would happen in Middle Street is basically that that third rail would end, and and the trains would have what's called a pantograph, which is a kind of a scissor device that that elevates up above the top of the car and touches a power wire up above, and that and that's been used for uh, over 150 years. It's called a pantograph, and it's a catenary power wire. So what happens is while people are getting off the train in Middle Street. The, the thing elevates, it only takes about five seconds. And then it's got power, off it goes, goes down to the street level. Okay, and there's no, um, there's no more difficult um, uh, kind of infrastructure other than just the overhead lines. So basically we have to change the design of our current cars. And on, Ansaldo makes all of these different types of cars. So basically we have to go back to our contract with them and they have already delivered, as you know, four cars. But these cars are a $2 million item. So if, if we have to just set aside four cars and say, okay, that's $8 million worth of cars we can't use, that's a minor loss compared to the, the savings of $4 billion. True, so um, would each car need to be have one of these catenaries? No, no, it's just one car per train. So now one of our changes is, is that we actually want to make the trains back to two cars long uh, instead of four. There's no reason, the original hard design was for a two car train and for some reason, the, the ex-director, Dan Grabowskis, decided he wanted to make the trains bigger. He, he, was, he was kind of thinking in terms of long-term ridership ability. But we're saying, actually, no. The two-car train is fine. You just run it twice as often. The, he was going to do four cars at, at six-minute intervals. We said, no, go back to your first plan two car trains at three minute intervals. The reason is because when you get into the streets uh, in the short blocks in downtown, a four car train is too long. It, it laps over uh, into spin. intersections yeah. and it blocks okay. intersections. Uh, but for, certainly from a rider's point of view, that's, that's way better anyway. It's actually more convenient, yeah, right. Does, to have trains twice as often. Would it actually limit ridership or, or reduce ridership? No, no, not at all. No. no, your ridership is not related to train size. It, it's just how many people want to get in on the train. And, and as trains, as, as more and more people decide to ride the train, you can just add trains in their frequency. Okay, and what about, um, so let's have, we have some great little mock-ups of how this would look in our downtown area. Let's see some of those. Okay, this one is on Hotel Street. Now, we're not advocating any particular route right now. One, one option is to run it down Hotel and just use the existing uh, bus, bus lanes. Um, because these trains are no bigger than a bus uh, in terms of width and so forth. So that's a shot of what it would look like if we use the, the Hotel Street Transit Corridor for, for trains as well as buses. That looks beautiful to me. And, and you can see how simple this is. Now this one does not show overhead wires. And Ansaldo does make um, an option for their, for their trains in which you don't use overhead wires. You actually draw your power from underground. So you can, uh, or you can even use a battery system. You can, you can install batteries in your car that are basically charge up at the last station and they can run for up to a mile with no power of their own. They're like an electric train. It's like a temporary electric train. So why did you, uh, ch you did the cost estimates based on the, the overhead wire catenary yeah. system? Yeah, they're, they're, that's an equivalent cost, whether it's an overhead power wire or it's an underground power wire, the, the cost is the same. And well, you know, they're still vastly cheaper than all of that concrete, that enormous, ele uh, you know, elevated guideway and those elevated stations with their escalators and their elevators and their, um, you know, um, security guards and, and all the lighting. So that's what really 
adds up the cost. It would seem that very or having that underground would be a lot nicer than and um, storm resilient. Yeah, uh, that's actually a good point. Better. Yeah, uh, that they, it works well. It, it, there's no problem with rainwater and everything. They're they're insulated cables. Um, and they, they run under the ground. There's actually four different systems out there right now. All the different rail car manufacturers have their own version of wireless power. They call it wireless. But the ones that we already have on order, the system that we currently are, are sort of contractually wedded to, right. um, they do offer the um, in-ground version. Yes, they do. That's Beautiful. called Tramwave. And Tram Saldo Tramwave system. Okay. And this has been out for, uh, it came out in 2009, so it's been out now for eight years. Yeah. Um, and we have an another picture of how it might look downtown. Um, oh, yes. I yeah. love that. It's cute. Yeah. It's actually that, cute. It, how simple is that? And this is King Street. This is putting a train basically in the in the bus lane of the existing of the existing bus lane. As we know, King Street is very wide uh, through most of its length, and you you can you can even make this an exclusive lane just for trains and buses if you want, and it really won't impact the traffic. You know, we we know that uh, King Street has already been taken over for a bus lane, uh, sorry, a bike lane, for about three miles. Uh, so. We know um, this street does have capacity. And um, certainly this kind of system has been vetted in places where there's lots of um, pedestrians mm -hmm. and bicycle traffic and, yeah. uh, for, for decades. So we're not inventing <clears throat> any, anything here. Yeah, I mean, this, the city has raised, oh, there's safety concerns. You know, we've got, what about dogs and people and bikes? Well, the, you know, traffic in cities has been around for hundreds of years. And what are, one of our uh, uh, links on our website uh, is 28 other cities of our size, of, you know, a million to two million, that have light rail systems. And so you can look at pictures of, you know, Baltimore, Austin, Portland, Seattle, uh, you name it. And there, there are people walking around, and there's, you know, cars and bikes and so forth. And it, it coexists very easily. I've seen it in cities in um, in Europe, actually, um, mm -hmm. that, and it's just a, a part of the landscape. But yeah. we used to have it here. I was looking at a map yeah. of Honolulu in nine in 1897 last night. Wow. It's um it's downtown at Colliers International in their lobby. If you want to go have it, and it shows the tramways. I mean, I it's this is not even and, new. And, for and weren't those in the center of the city? In the center of the street. 97. So. Actually, yeah, you know, saying that we don't have space for a train is kind of nonsensical because these these cities were laid out with trams way back in the 1890s. It, that that map shows both railroad lines and tramways, so both. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, even where I live in Manoa, they had streetcars that went up all the way up University Avenue, up into Kamehameha Avenue, and then did, they did a turnaround uh, in the middle of the valley. Scott, we're gonna take a little break and then talk about, um, come back and talk about um, what kinds of possibilities this would open up for us. Great, okay. Hi, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm the host for Moving Hawaii Forward, and the show is dedicated to transportation and traffic issues in Oahu. Um, we are all frustrated by sitting in our cars uh, in bumper to bumper traffic. And this show is dedicated to talking to with folks that not only we can define the problem, but we hopefully can come to the table with some solutions. So I invite you to join me every Tuesday at 12 noon and let's move Hawaii forward. Aloha Kako, I'm Marcia Joyner and I'm inviting you to navigate the journey. We are discussing the end of life options, and we would really love to have you every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. right here. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas, and I am talking with Scott Wilson, architect and um, uh, spokesperson for the Honolulu Transit Task Force. Right. So we are talking about bringing that 
rail project um, back down to earth, saving taxpayers at least $3 billion, and relieving our beautiful city of this horrible blight in the process. It's such a win-win. Mm -hmm. it, it, it does. It does seem like it. From, from you know, I think when we when we went around to legislators this morning, they they were like saying, "Oh, thank goodness, there's an alternative." Oh, that's uh, very encouraging. Yeah. So so this is. Uh, I, I think you know we want to talk about what what can we do in the future. We're not backing a specific bill or you know specific uh, routing right now, but we just we just need to uh, bring up the idea that there is a plan B. There is. We don't literally have to go with this um, current elevated rail, which is just too expensive. It's, um, that's kind of a big deal that there's no, there's no bill attached to this. Um, have you talked to the f uh, good folks at Honolulu Heli? Not yet. Okay. No. All right. Well, they're, they're, next. they're kind of in their own little silo right now about rail. And, okay. and, and really one of the reasons we're, we're at the legislature is because those folks are, are one step away from this project. It's not their project so much as it's a city project. But now they're being drawn into this because they're being asked to refund it uh, for you know, several more billion dollars. And, and this comes after they were already asked two years ago for a big hunk of money and they were promised, oh, that's all we need, that's all we will be done. We promise this will finish the whole job and now suddenly it's only bringing it to Middle Street. Okay, and when you say finish the whole job, you're talking about from where to where? Well, the, the current plan is to finish it at Ala Moana Center. Okay. Uh, on Kona Street, it's just going to dead end into the buildings that, that cross over Kona Street. So this, this, uh, w this is one of my pet peeves, is that, is that if they ex try to extend this project to UH on Kona Street, they're going to run into three stories of retail shops. And they have not said anything to the public about this, the fact that Oh yeah, we can extend it to UH. Well, in fact, it's going to be a superhuman project because they have to back up, build a whole new ramp that goes up to 90 feet and goes over all those retail shops, oh, well. uh, oh, well. Williams Sonoma, all those uh, Design Within Reach, all those ones. There's two whole levels of shops that that cross over uh, Kona Street, so you can't go right through those. That's that's a, a working you know, a working shopping center, one of the big, biggest and, bu and busiest in the world. And that, that um, connection to UH Manoa is so critical. As we know, yeah. when Manoa is not in session, uh, there's Suddenly no Suddenly the traffic is so much nicer. <laughs> We're all going, wow. <laughs> oh, it's just because it's a UH holiday. <laughs> exactly. And yet, and, yet uh, and the mayor has, uh, has candidly said, you know, we really should extend this to UH. But he's not, the other part of the story is, is that to extend it to UH the way it's built now is, is blindingly expensive. It would be the most expensive section of all. So you have a picture of what it would look like if it were going um, up to UH. Yes. If we just ran this up King Street, uh, as you saw in the earlier slide, yeah. uh, by King Kamehameha statue, we just kept on King, even in just the simplest route possible, run it to King. There it is uh, in the downtown area, and, and uh, uh, again, the nice part about running it on King Street is that when people get off, they're right in where they need to be. They can just walk left or right, and they're right immediately in their, in their office building. They don't have to walk all the way up from Nimitz Highway. Right, and then it could be extended to UH Manoa. Right, now here's a shot. Now these, you can see the overhead wires on this, and, and this was an earlier design where it was coming up University Avenue, it was actually gonna go under the freeway and actually stop right at Bachman Hall. But you can easily imagine that the, the train is coming down King Street now, and then it just makes a big U-turn right at Moylili, at, P at Puck Sally, and then it goes back on, on Baratania. And with all that new development that Kamehameha Schools is doing yeah. right in that area, this is the perfect time the, to be planning the UH, and contemplating. The now. UH official said, actually, we don't want the train coming right onto our campus. That's too close. Give it to us in Moylili and Puck Sally, that's fine, the students can walk from there. Well, did they say that even when it was this? 
Yes, actually they did. You, oh, that's surprising. I, you know, if you remember about five years ago, there were there were some simulations where it was going to go over the freeway and it was going to go all the way to Stan Sheriff Center. The university quietly said, no, thank you. We don't want a train emptying out all kinds of people on our campus. Well, I understand that, but I was thinking if it was at grade and it was going up university or yeah. in there, that that might be a they, different. They did not matter. react to that one. They, they never got that far. OK. All right. So that, that is a, a possibility. Yeah, it okay. is. OK. I, I think the simplest way is actually just to come down university, drop everybody off at Moylele, and then just turn right around and go up Baratania and, and back out to, to Eva. So that was my next question about the return route. The return route would be very similar uh, to that shot you saw on King Street, except it would be on Baratania. Because again, Baratania is one way. It's got many lanes. It's got parking lanes that we can take out. And then you just run it all the way into town, all the way in Baratania, and all the way past Alla Park. And then it, it would join in again at North King. And then it, you can decide whether you want to go on Dillingham or you want to go on North King. That's, that's a, a fine point of the route that we can, we can decide later. OK. And you've talked about building this. We have a, 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 an image of, of what it would like, it, what it takes. So tell us about this. Oh, yeah. Oh, this, this is, you could just imagine that those are all just local contractors. Because, I mean, when you look at that, that kind of work where you're, you're building, a, a, you're putting steel rails into a, a concrete form that's about 14 inches deep, well, that's something any local mason can do. This is not, this is not a multi-billion dollar Kiwit or outside mainland firm that has to be brought in because the work is so technical and, and difficult. This, the beautiful thing about this and the reason it can be built so quickly is you can actually have a dozen different companies working in different blocks. And they, they have one plan, and then they just connect up their segments when they finish them up. It's so beautifully simple. Oh, the I more mean, I hear about you, this, you the more just, excited I am. You just cut the steel, <laughs> you weld it, and, and it's done. You know, it, it, the, the trouble that with this elevated rail is that it's, those are all very customized segments. So you have to put in one segment first, then you can put in the second one, and then next. And so this thing has to be built very carefully and sequentially from start to the other end. And that's why it's going to take another eight years to get to all Moana. Well, those of us who don't regularly go out to um, Kapolei and haven't had to deal with um, the pain of the mm -hmm. construction of that, mm -hmm. um, I, I only have had to on occasion, but um, I was already unhappy about the situation. But when I saw that, that, that was the, the moment of truth. And I just said, well, it, this can't be. I know. We can't do this to Honolulu. What have we done? To, I mean, I feel terrible for Waipahu and Pearl, Pearl Ridge. And, and, and the, the real secret, Koei, is that, is that they haven't even built the stations yet. And, and if any of you have ever gone to Miami, Miami is the only elevated rail system in all of North America that goes right through the center of a city. And it is just outrageously ugly. Uh, it, it's in a tropical environment similar to Honolulu. The concrete just molds and decays and stains, and it is so depressing. Um, we had one member of our team go to Miami and take pictures of the elevated stations. And when we when he started showing them to us, we just we were cringing. Are, are those on the website? And tell us again what the, about your website. The website is called salvagetherail.org, and it has lots of reports. It has videos that explain how street level rail works. It has pictures of all these other cities that have street rail. rail, rail. It has many different reports. So if you want to read more, if you want to read the one page version, you want to read the six page version, the 20 page, and even the 60 page version. Well, we have studied light rail in Honolulu in, in all these different levels and, and, and agreed. And tell us, who is we? We, the Honolulu <coughs> Transit Task Force, formerly known as the AIA Honolulu Transit Task Force. This was in 2009 to 2011. I was the chair. That once rail started being built, we basically disbanded and we formed the Regional and Urban Design Committee 
that I, I was also chair of from about 2011 to 2016. So it was a group of about between 12 and 20 architects and planners. They all belong to AIA Honolulu. However, in December, when we finally came out with our report, AIA Honolulu as an organization said, you know what, we're, we're uncomfortable. Uh, we don't want to offend the mayor here. He's just been reelected. This is uh, awkward uh, because some of us uh, have to get work from the city. So can we just quietly bury this report and <laughs> you will <laughs> zip your mouth and throw away the key. So. We said, okay, as an organization, we understand you don't want to endorse this. Um, we are going to go independent. So uh, that same group of uh, architects and some of them whom had to stay anonymous. Now, some of them are listed on our, on our website, but there's a group of them that are, are still anonymous because of, of their, their working with the city. It's so sad, um, but I, I know personally that um, I'm involved with an organization that went through that same process and mm. didn't want to offend, um, yeah. offend the mayor. So we, we are a, a small great guy. town. Kirk, we're, we're doing your work for you. <laughs> we are a small town, and I think we pride ourselves on our small townness. We are friendly. We, we like to work by consensus. We, yeah. like, it. we yeah. like everybody to be on the same page, and, it, and it's really awkward when we were when there are some issues that just we just cannot resolve so in the last minute and a half scott mm. how can um we support you thank you i appreciate that uh well the i think the first thing is to visit our website and and read up uh and and get yourself familiar with this that there's a very real option out there then the second side the second thing to do is to contact your legislator, and that is we have a sample letter on our website. We would urge you, read that through if you like the sound of it. It just says, dear legislator, uh, we really would like to save money and time on the rail. We urge you to consider other alternatives and to reject the extension of the GET surcharge. That's where it starts, because the city, if we just give them their money, they're going to say, okay, I'm done, you know, end of discussion. But if the legislators have the courage to say, wait a minute, it's, we're not going to give you your money. You know what? We won't want you to look at the alternatives. Thank you, Scott. We're, so our job is, to, our homework is to go to uh, salvagetherail.org salvage yep. and contact our legislators, legislators and tell them do not approve the GET um, for extension for the rail. Exactly. Okay. And in the meantime, you'll be working with your awesome group and yes. um, the legislatures and come up with a really good um, bill. Yep. Maybe not for this session because it's a little late. Yeah. But um, it'll happen. It will happen. All right.